Okay, uh, I think we're about good to get going. Um, it's wonderful to see so many of you here. Thank you so much for coming along. And yes, welcome to African Perspectives on Phenology Monitoring. Um, so I'm Aaron. I'm just going to help with mostly behind the scenes things today. And um, so just a little bit of housekeeping before we get going. Um, we welcome you to all turn on your videos if you'd like. If you would like to improve your connection, you can also just leave them off. And during the presentations, we just ask if you keep your mics muted, but there will be short discussions in breakout rooms after each presentation, and there will be a large discussion towards the end of the session. So obviously during those, you can turn on your mic and speak to everyone. And there's also a chat function, and you can send a chat to everyone. You can perhaps do that to introduce yourself during uh, our introduction, which is just about to come after I've given you all some housekeeping. Um, you can also use that to discuss if you prefer. And you can also send either myself, or Herbie. Herbie, if you can give everyone a wave. Yeah, I'm pretty also, sure. Emma, um, you can send any of us, uh, if, you've, if you're having any technical problems or have a question, you can send that directly to us through the chat as well. So the discussion sessions, um, we will have opportunities to do those in English and French. So if you prefer to be in a breakout room, which is French, if you could leave your name, just saying so in the chat, or contact Hervé and we can organise that so that you can be in a, a French speaking room in the breakout rooms. So essentially we'll have uh, a group of presentations on one site and then a small breakout room session. And then we'll have, we'll all come together for a few questions with the speaker before we move on to the next session. Um, we are going to be chaired today by Irvi, who's already introduced himself. And Emma, she will introduce herself um, when one after her introduction. So let's move on to Emma's introduction. While Aaron is just um, starting the screen share for my presentation, I would encourage you just to write in the chat um, who you are and where you're from and what your involvement is with phenology monitoring so that we can um, learn a bit about who's, who's in the meeting today. So please do that during my presentation. Hello everyone and welcome to the first of our series of workshops from the African Phenology Network as part of our COP26 project. Um, I'm just going to spend a couple of minutes introducing you to uh, this workshop and um, introducing you to a little bit of the background of the African Phenology Network um, before handing over to our um, brilliant speakers today to find out um, more about their experience um, in, in African phenology research. And to start off with, I thought I would just uh, remind us about um, the beautiful world that we live in and um, the way that the health of our living planet um, depends on many tightly interconnected ecosystems and the organisms that live within them. And phenology is all about um, observing and noticing when a, when a plant produces leaves or an animal gives birth um, and how uh, this only not, not only fulfills a function within the life cycle of that organism, but also impacts on the many plants, animals and people that depend on these seasonal resources. And phenology is the scientific study of these recurring biological events. <laughs> which are highly sensitive to climate cues, making them extremely relevant today. So we know that the world's climate is rapidly changing and this has knock-on effects for the living processes of our natural world. Um, phenology monitoring has been described 
in the fourth IPCC report as perhaps the simplest process in which to track changes in the ecology of species in, in response to climate change. And it's been proposed as a global essential biodiversity variable required to study, report and manage biodiversity change. Um, and this is especially important because of the sensitivity of phenological processes. Changes in phenology have serious impacts for plants, animals, humans, and even the functioning of our living planet through feedbacks to the climate system. Um, our recent publication from Lope National Park in Gabon shows that warming temperatures may have already reduced natural fruit production um, in this relatively well protected tropical forest within Central Africa. Um, and this just shows how how serious the impacts of climate change can be um, on, you know, maintenance of tropical forest um, and for the animals and people that rely on the, on resources such as fruit production. So to successfully adapt to climate change, um, decision makers in African nations need much better information on natural and agricultural systems, the availability of natural resources, and the ways that people depend on them. Um, and this is incredibly important in this region of the world where um, so many people rely directly on um, either natural ecosystems for resources such as um, timber, um, food, fuel, um, and also directly on small scale agricultural ecosystems. So phenology research in the Northern Hemisphere has been accelerated through tightly coordinated research networks, such as the USA National Phenology Network. And uh, these initiatives have, have encouraged standardised data collection, large scale, long term research, often using citizen scientists and are even at the stage now where um, they're starting to be able to deliver real time forecasts to government. Um, in terms of the emergence of agricultural pests or um, you know, phenological changes to ecosystems. However, I'm sure you're aware that by comparison, ecological and weather data of all kinds is lacking in tropical regions, and this severely hampers vulnerability assessments to climate change. Um, phenology networks are, uh, we have phenology networks you know, scattered throughout the world, um, but these are really underdeveloped in the tropics. However, there are sites where research has been undertaken um, and sometimes for many years, probably the two most well-known um, field sites in the tropics are BCI um, Panama and Lope National Park Gabon, um, what most well known for their phenology data collection, which in both sites has been going on consistently for over 30 years, which gives us a really good baseline to try to begin to understand the impacts of climate change during that time period on these tropical forests. So this is where we come in as the African Phenology Network. Um, the, the history of phenology research in at least Central Africa is very much dominated by um, mammal biologists who are seeking to understand the seasonal availability of food resources for chimpanzees, gorillas, elephants, etc. So these researchers had informal networks, obviously they knew of each other and um, you know, influenced each other in terms of their work. Um, Andy Plumtree of WCS sort of spearheaded bringing together this this data um, about 10 years ago for the first time and that resulted in a paper by Samina Adamescu in 2018 um, looking at the frequency of fruit production across multiple sites tropical sites um, in Africa and um, after that we established ourselves as an online network called the African Phenology Network. We have a Twitter account and a website and um, our initial aim was to um, just provide metadata for existing research sites so that people could, could know where phenology data was being um, 
taken in the field and connect with other researchers and start to, to form this, this expert network to um, develop this science in, in this region. So the main aims of the African Phenology Network today are to support research collaborations um, in the almost continuous growing season of the tropics. Phenology research often requires decades of monitoring to determine productivity cycles. If we coordinate research already underway um, across multiple sites, then we hope that we can fast track our understanding of climate impacts on ecosystem processes and that we can do this in a time frame where action can still be taken. Um, also really keen to widen access to expert networks and establish new methods in the field. Um, so just having an online presence is really useful for this. Um, those of us um, who are actively involved in the network have met each other through um, the website, through the Twitter account, and we are working together to um, trial new field methods such as phenological cameras and mobile data forms. And we really want to make that information as widely available to other researchers um, as we can. Um, a, a very you know, important aim of the network is to grow new leadership in this field. And in 2020, um, we appointed a steering group made up of early career researchers um, who have um, experience in this field and also the ambition to, to grow this network into um, something that can you know, deliver really useful results for African nations. And finally, you know, the main um, purpose of doing this research is to support a thriving planet. I think um, phenological data is vitally important to understand how um, species interact within ecosystems, how people depend on ecosystems, um, whether that's through agricultural or natural resources, um, and how uh, ecosystems feed back to the, the global system um, through, through climate and atmosphere. And I think phenology is going to become more and more important as Africa adapts to the climate change it has and is going to be experiencing. Um, so that's our sort of main aim of growing this network is to support decision makers as they um, adapt to the changes that are coming to all of us via climate change. So um, that's all from me just now, and I will hand over to our um, three speakers who are going to give us more information on their experience of um, being involved in phenology research in various contexts on the African context, uh, African continent. And um, I look forward to um, speaking with you all in the discussion later on and um, using this opportunity to form new connections between researchers and um, grow the network even further. Thanks very much. So that being a pre-recorded presentation, I'm just going to add in a couple of extra things um, just now, if you will let me. Um, so thank you everyone for introducing yourself in the chat. It's really interesting to see um, who we've got here on this call and uh, people's background and, and interest in, in phenology monitoring. Um, obviously, we've got people joining from all around the world and in different time zones and in different contexts and we will also be we're recording this meeting and it will be shared on YouTube later on for anyone who wasn't able to join um, currently. Um, so please do continue to introduce yourself there as we carry on it's really nice to, to get that background um, and just to reiterate we're gonna have sort of three blocks of presentations so this first one is going to be from Lope National Park in Gabon. Um, we're going to hear from Hervé Memiagi, who is a Gabonese researcher and PhD student studying at the University of Oregon. Um, also uh, Kate Abernethy, who is Professor of Tropical Ecology at the University of Stirling and has been involved in phenology monitoring and other ecological research at Lope National Park for almost 20 years. And Loic Makaga, who is the current station manager at Lope National Park. Um, and we're really looking forward to hearing 
the three perspectives from, from these uh, members of the research team there on, on phenology monitoring. And um, so that's going to be three presentations coming up now. And um, after that, we'll have this breakout session, which will just be a chance to catch up. Uh, two of these presentations are in English, one is in French. And if uh, you've just got any points of clarification that you'd like to ask in, in your, you know, the language that you're most comfortable in, we can do that during the breakout session. And then we'll just have five minutes for um, a short discussion all together on, on those presentations before moving on to the next research site. So um, I think Aaron's gonna load the presentation now from um, the first presentation from Lope. Lope National Park, it's one of the 30 national parks of Gabon. This park covers uh, four of the nine provinces. Aaron, we're not seeing the presentation. I don't know if that's... I can hear it, but not see it. Is that just me or...? Lupe National Park, it's one of the... Th Sorry, just bear with us while we sort that out. Everyone, sorry about that. Um, it just seems to be when I go into the video itself, the sharing is stopping. So um, yeah, you have to open the video and then sharing that. I'll give that a try. Thank you. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And is going to be born of old Sarah, Baron Sarah. That's it. Here we go. So one of the thirty national park of Gabon. This park covers uh, four of the nine provinces of Gabon. And the area, the total area, it's, a, it's around uh, 540,000 40, hectares. It is covered mostly by forests and by savanna. The forests cover 85% of the area and the savanna cover 15% uh, and here you can see a view of uh, savanna forest mosaic and a view of uh, the forest canopy except uh, this uh, diversity of habitat the park also is recognized for its population of uh, forest elephant uh, mandrid and different other uh, wildlife the park also is a village or segment of different uh, local community. And here you have different villages, uh, among other ones that uh, I didn't uh, map here. For the phenology, the phenology co is conducted in the northern part of uh, Lobe, in the, in the in the area where we have the savanna forest mosaic. This area, it's, a, it's about 33 kilometers square and it includes different types of forests. The, fo the mature forest, the marantase forest, the young forest, the forest which is taking over savanna. And this phenology have been conducted since uh, 1984 and Loic will give you more detail how the phenology conduct on the ground. Great, thank you, Hervé. And we'll just uh, follow with, I think, the presentation from, from Kate next. talk to you today about the long-term phenology monitoring that's carried out in Lope National Park in Gabon by the University of Stirling, which I work for, and um, in collaboration with the Government of Gabon's Ministry for Water and Forests. 
The study has been running for 40 years. It's the longest uh, continuous study of phenology in Africa, one of the longest studies in the world in the tropics. And that's meant that we've had to finance salaries and training and data management protocols uh, and, and analysis throughout that time. Um, this has been quite a challenge and some of the ways that we've uh, managed to privilege a long term study is by making our observations repeated only once a month rather than maybe more frequently and by highly training specific individuals who we train try to retain on staff for up to 10 years as, as data collectors so that we get a high consistency of, um, of observations, very little difference between observers and um, a high accuracy in, uh, in the data they're taking. The trade-off is that we maybe get lower precision because we make a fairly simple score on the tree and we only take data once a month. I think these are trends that these are playoffs that you have to make that um, intense studies where uh, measurements are taken very rapidly um, uh, often highly accurately but it's very difficult to maintain that level of investment for, for the long period so we've chosen um, to go for the long term with a once a month measure and that's allowed us to look at change over time uh, particularly in response to climate change and weather change weather local weather changes uh, driven by global changes and, and that's becoming a very important aspect of uh, what phenology monitoring can do and i think uh, lope is, um, is is a good example of the importance of long-term data and how you might uh, need to make trade-offs in the way you collect data in order to maintain that monitoring for the long term. Thanks Kate and finally we're going to hear from uh, Loic Makaga who um, is the station manager for um, the research station at Lope National Park who's going to describe how the monitoring occurs in the field. Bonjour, je suis Loïc Macaga, je suis gestionnaire de la station de recherche de la Lopé. Je vais donc vous faire une brève description de comment nous collectons les données climat Euh, via le suivi euh, phénologie des arbres ici à la SGC. Euh, depuis plus de 30 ans, les équipes de la SGC suivent entre 770 et 800 arbres. Aujourd'hui, nous avons 744 arbres. Et cette collecte se fait tous les mois six jours tous les mois entre le premier et le 15 sur les six circuits. Donc les six circuits que nous suivons sont le circuit Kepok, le circuit central, le circuit tortue, le circuit euh, ch euh, chameau, le circuit bosquet et le circuit crête. Et tous ces circuits sont géographiquement euh, disposés dans des différents types de forêts. Des forêts qui longent les rivières, des forêts en altitude comme euh, chameau, des forêts amarantacées et des forêts plus ou moins clairsemées. Et maintenant, je veux expliquer comment nous, les équipes, collecte les données. Il y a quatre catégories. Il y a la catégorie des feuilles, la catégorie des fruits, la catégorie des fleurs et les dommages des insectes et les dommages des éléphants. Sur la catégorie des, des feuilles, nous avons les nouvelles feuilles, les feuilles matures et les feuilles mortes ou asséchées. Et comment les équipes interprètent ces données 
Ces données sont interprétées dans une fourchette, quantitativement dans une fourchette entre 0 et 4. Que ce soit pour les feuilles, que ce soit pour les, les, les fleurs et les fruits. Par exemple, un arbre peut avoir des nouvelles feuilles et peut aussi avoir des feuilles mortes et des feuilles matures. Donc, on fait l'opération interprète sur quatre. Nous, nous, euh, nous, nous regardons euh, en termes quantitatifs quelles sont les feuilles, euh, que, que, quelles sont les catégories les plus dominantes entre les trois, entre les, les, les mortes, les nouvelles et les, les matures. Et c'est sur ça que nous faisons les calculs entre 0 et 4. C'est la même chose pour les fruits. Entre les fruits matures et immatures, nous, nous nous interprétons en faisant des calculs quantitativement. Donc, voilà, je vous remercie. Many thanks, Loic. Um, so now we're just going to have an opportunity um, to ask any questions that you have in, in short breakout rooms. So in a minute, Aaron will press a magic button and we will all disappear into these breakout rooms. And if you have requested to be in a French speaking breakout room, hopefully you will arrive in the right place. Um, and this is an opportunity just to um, either if you don't have any questions, maybe to introduce yourself. Um, you can go take a break if you need for three minutes. Um, but if you have any questions related to the presentations, maybe you are a French or English only speaker and just want to ask, ask a couple of questions, then feel free to use this time. We'll just have three minutes, we'll return together. And if you have any questions for the speakers at that time related to these presentations, um, then that is your opportunity to ask them. At that point, you can put your hand up on the Zoom and I'll come to you and ask what your question is. Um, are we ready for the breakout rooms, Aaron? Um, just give me a little second. I have okay. to still add a few more people in. That's fine. Um, I'll uh, just take a chance to just say as well that we're during this workshop, we're hearing from three of the main sites involved in the um, this current steering group of the Phenology Network. Um, we've all got quite different experiences of phenology monitoring. Lope is a long term site that's been monitoring for a long time and you'll hear from the others have got different and new perspectives bringing to phenology monitoring and um, at the end of this workshop we're hoping to have a discussion around those themes about where we see the future of phenology monitoring um, on the African content and how we can bring these kind of perspectives together. So please be thinking about that as we go forward um, and kind of gathering your ideas and, and comments for for the end of, of this uh, workshop when we discuss that. Okay, go join your breakout room now.
Okay, I'll just, it's, I think that's everybody returned from, was that quite short, Hervé? Yeah, it was short. It was very short and we didn't have time to talk. I don't know if we can uh, add like five more minutes because we have to move people from other room to be in the French uh, group. Yeah. yeah. Do you um do you feel that we need that time now or, or should we do that for the next? I think it will be a... Uh, it will be a lot to change from one side to another one. Let's let's take a time to finish with that first uh, session and then we can move to the next one. I don't know what people think, yeah. Yeah, I can just reopen the breakout rooms. Yeah, be because some people will want French words uh, to other group. Okay, okay. Yeah. Should we just do that now for another few minutes? Yeah. Yes. Okay. Yeah, let's do a few more minutes. Hi, Aaron, can you put me back in group two? <laughs> Sorry, that was an accident. I didn't mean to do that.
Okay, I'll just, um, is that everybody returned from the, yeah. Um, so I hope that was a useful opportunity just to clarify some points. Um, does anybody have anything that they want to, we've just got maybe three minutes now, anything they wanted to say to the wider group following um, those presentations or is there, should we keep that for discussion at the end? If you could just raise your hand or start speaking or say something in the chat. Um. Okay, in which case, because we had the extra time on the breakout sessions, I think, on the breakout sessions, I think. we'll move on to the next site, if that's okay. <laughs> Yeah, it's okay. Great. So, Elve, I'll hand over to you, and you can introduce the next um, the next presentation. Oh, okay. So we, we now we are going to move to another part of Africa, which is uh, Kenya, and we will get some presentation from there. Try to understand the work they are doing in uh, in terms of phenology. So, Aaron, if you can start uh, the first video. Good afternoon and thank you to the workshop organisers for the opportunity to introduce our work on phenology and African tree species, which is a long-term collaboration between OCEH and the Kenyan Forestry Research Institute. I'm Stephen Cabers, I study evolution in trees. I'll provide some background and then I'm going to hand over to my colleagues David O'Day and Asinat Adiengi from Kefri to add detail and thoughts on potential for the African Phenology Network. Our interest in tree phenology has several motivations. First, the timing of key traits in trees is an adaptation to their environment. Understanding this helps us to understand current and potential responses to climate change. Second, reproductive phenology is the key driver in determining how genes move around in the landscape, another dynamic that governs responses to climate change. Linked to these are also some key applications, a basic practical need to have patterns and variations in flowering and fruiting to be able to plan seed production and quantifying what genetic diversity is out there for use as the raw material for tree improvement and selection. Finally, and in many ways most importantly, we need to know where and how much diversity is out there in the landscape to be able to protect what remains and to plan in situ and ex situ conservation where we need it. And with that, I'll hand over to my colleague, David O'Day. Thank you, Stephen. A quick check with the Kenya Forestry Seed Center, a major tree seed supplier in the region shows that most species that are currently in the demand are exotic timber or agroforestry species. On phenology work, we are currently focusing on Melia wokensai, member of the Meliesi family, and Moringa species belonging to the monogenetic Moringesi family. Melia wokensai is native to Eastern Africa and is fast growing timber species suitable for the drylands, while Moringa olefera is an excep exceptionally useful multipurpose species <coughs> in northwestern India at the foothills of Himalayas and is currently cultivated across the tropics and Moringa stenopetala alongside other lesser known conspecifics are native to Eastern Africa. We also have a wide range of other species which are of interest for phenology work. These species cover the breadth of most of ecoclimatic zones in the region from the lowlands to the highlands and to, from the drylands to the tropical mountain forest ecosystem. A number of these species have been studied in terms of phylogeography and genetics, but their phenology are still poorly understood. As we deliberate on, on this workshop, I also thought that we should also think of linking with other uh, networks across Africa, which are carrying out similar studies. For example, a recent publication, which has just been uh, published in the first, past few weeks, 
uh, is reporting on the forest geo sites, a global network of large long-term forest dynamic plots, which has about 71 plots in 20, 27 countries and mainly undertaking tree census and biodiversity studies. And it, in our region, we have a few of these sites. Um, and then there are also other uh, global uh, networks, for example, the Global Ecosystem Monitoring Network, and also the ILTA and FLAXNET sites. This could also be useful for us because they have already established uh, some, infra some kind of infrastructure, which we could also, uh, if we have uh, people involved in these studies, could also uh, help expand uh, our knowledge of phenology of the species which are occurring in, in these sites. There are also global research uh, networks such, such as the Integrated Land Ecosystem Atmosphere Process Study of which I'm a member. This is a useful uh, network which also links scientists to key societal challenges, acts as a communication hub and also promote scientific excellence through de developing international science initiatives that are multidisciplinary. But most importantly also for a group here, especially for the early career scientists, it promotes leadership in science through capacity building uh, in developing countries. And I think the, we could also see how we, our work integrates into the overall picture of land atmosphere ecosystem to address some of the phenological issues uh, of, of, of our target species. Thank you. So we, Iron, do you still have another presenter from Kenya? Yes, next we're gonna hear from Asana Adyenge. She has two separate videos for her presentation. Okay. At the University of Nairobi Field Station, Kipajeni Experiment. At the University of Nairobi Field Station, Kibwezi, Okweni County in Kenya was established on 4th November, 2018. The trial contains 14 provinces of Moringa, of which eight are naturalized populations of Moringa olifera from Kenya and four are international accessions. The trial also contains two indigenous Moringa stenopetala populations from Baringo and Isiolo. This trial is part of the international initiative supported and coordinated by the UK Centre for Ecology and Hydrology under Sunrise Project. The UK Centre for Ecology and Hydrology is in collaboration with the Kenya Forestry Research Institute. Moringa is a very important agroforestry tree species with multiple uses. For example, we have, we have vegetables, we have medicinal, we have fodder, we have oil, we have water purification, among others. This trial was established to study the phenotypic traits and genetic composition of Moringa species under different ecological zones, of which we have two other trials in Ramogi and Kitui. In a nutshell, Moringa is a very important dryland tree which can be used for food security and resilience to climate change. Damage. Damage. 
20%. Okay, I think we are at the end of uh, this session. Ion, can you confirm? Yeah, and also I have a request for you. Can you add the time to 10 minutes? I don't know if you can for the each room. For the breakout rooms? Yeah, we yeah. can add on a few more minutes. Yeah. Okay. So we will move again to the breaking room. And at this time, you can talk about the first session if you, you still have a question. And also for this uh, few videos that we, we, we just watched about the work in Kenya. So you can join your session right now.
Okay, I think we're just waiting for Hervé to return from his breakout room. Um, while we're waiting, if anyone has a question that they wanted to, or a point they wanted to raise to the whole group following um, the Kenya presentations, please do write them in the chat so we can see what's coming up. Okay, Elva, you are here. I'll hand back over to you. <laughs> I was just waiting for you to come back from your breakout oh, room. Oh, okay, yeah. So, yeah, at this time, we will move to uh, Ghana, where we will be hearing some presentation about the work they're also doing on phenology over there. So, I will, Aaron will give the Bishmark video. Everyone, I'm happy to present to you on perspectives on emerging phenology, research, and use of new technologies based on my PhD work on Liana phenology in Ghana. Lianas pictured here in contrast to trees are woody climbing plants. They are unable to support themselves structurally, and so they depend on trees to reach their canopy. They are known to be disturbance adapted and sensitive to microclimatic changes in tropical forest ecosystems where they are most common. Apart from their known function to negatively affect tree growth and population, they also provide important ecosystem services which employ the use of their leaves and fruit, stem, bark, roots. An example here are the deep folia rich in the extract 5 hydroxytryptophan an antidepressant, and this is in high demand in China and USA. A recent paper, Cunningham et al. 2021, raised concerns of, of uh, the sustainable supply of these seeds. As important as such services are, we realize that there is presently no study dedicated to um, the long-term monitoring of phenology of lianes which if we're able to do, will provide suggestions on the sustainability of these services, leaf production, fruit production, and flowering. Site data will again be useful over the long term because of the sensitivity of learners to microclimatic changes, could be useful for ecological monitoring and forecasting. So we decided to set up the Liana Phenology Project to help us um, monitor the patterns and establish these, the patterns of flowering, fruiting, and leaf production in the lianes. The key considerations for this study, because these were permanent plots, was where we placed them. We needed to put them in places where the security of the plots could be guaranteed. Um, we wouldn't want a place where you, you go in and the next day, um, you have some log, logging activity going there, you have the tax stolen and things like that. So we needed places where there was some security. And we also needed to select places um, with limited human interruption. The other consideration was what species to include and how many individuals to use and what tax, for example, should be used in this um, instance. And so we realized that we needed to include the species that were giving us some information that were expressing some phenology to begin with. That was the important consideration to make here. And once we selected individuals that were giving us some phenology already, then now the question on the number of individuals was automatically answered because that would be how many individuals were giving us um, phenological information. 
And the question on the tax, we had to settle on tax that were not fanciful, that were inexpensive, and tax that could also withstand fire because some of our sites were prone to fire outbreaks. If they were expensive and fanciful, um, any passersby or tourists could remove them and they could even take them for totally different purposes. And so we settled to use the aluminum tax pictured here. So we use aluminum tax and copper wires to tax the lians, and we also use the masking tapes to help um, with visibility of the plot. So with these uh, considerations in place, we proceeded to set up the plot. We set up 200 meter by 100 meter plots in each area, and we closely observed all lianas in this plot from the routing point all the way into the canopy along the stem for the presence of leaves, presence of flowers, and presence of fruit. Those that expressed any one of the phenophases we are considering were recruited. Other considerations that we also made was to ask what phenophases should be considered and to what detail. So we basically observed for presence and absence of any of the three phenophases on each individual. And we make some attempt to estimate the proportions of the subphases. If, for instance, um, um, flowers are present, we want to find out whether they are all buds or whether about 50% of the flowers are open buds, whether fruits are ripe or whether they are not ripe and what proportion of the fruits that have been observed are ripe and not ripe. So those, those, um, to that extent, we tried that we could not go to the extent of counting how many leaves were present or how many branches were producing leaves. That would be too detailed and um, it would virtually be impossible considering the nature of lianas. The other consideration was how many um, observations should be made per week, should it be daily, two or three times a week, because we did not want to miss any of the events. And we also realized that there would not be much variation um, daily. And so we settled for monitoring three times in a week, which is almost like every other day. We realized that um, data collection methods like the codes of the DBCH method were going to be complex for our and too technical for some of our field assistants. So we had to adapt and use something more flexible, something that is easy to explain and easy to use. And so we started originally to use um, conventional data collection sheets, pen and paper. And so for one lian individual, you need like two pages of information because you ask about leaf present. And the next question that follow will be the subfaces, flowers, subfaces. And so about two pages of, of, of paper. And this meant that I had to print and send data sheets to field assistants every month in remote locations and also transport completed sheets back to my office. And so it came with the risk of losing the sheets because this will mostly be transported by public, um, public transport. And so from my previous experience, I realized that we could use COBO forms or ODK forms to collect data on the field. And it will be a matter of coding the, the form and deploying it on the COBO Collect mobile app for Android. And when I did the assessment, I realized that the annual cost of printing and transportation and the risk for each site was higher than buying a cheap tablet that was also durable, which can also last us a year or even two years. And so we went for that option of using Kobo Collect. And we also realized that um, this was also not only cost effective, but also convenient. It guaranteed the security of data sheets, reduced opportunity for errors, and um, the forms could also be designed to be smart, intelligent, and interactive using prompt skip logic and also including some restrictions. So we did a full trial where I had the opportunity to train uh, my full assistants, Same in Bobri, Moist Semidecidios, Eben in Ankata, Whatever Green Forest, and Isaac in Boabin Fiema Monkey Central, the Dry Semidecidios Forest. And so after that training, they went ahead and they began to use um, um, the, the Kobo form. So there is a video presentation on the back end coding, which can be done online or in Excel. And um, that has been shared with 
African Technology Network and can be made available for anyone interested. So in the coding, some of the questions can be made compulsory. So in this case, um, the data collector would have to select one forest out of these three before they can proceed to the next um, sheet. And then on this page, they have to select um, one plot necessarily before they can proceed. Uh, so you don't end up with a situation where field forms travel all the way from about nine hours away to the office and you do realize that the data collector forgot to indicate the plot for some of the sheets. And so some of those instances are um, removed. Forms can also be coded to ask for GPS coordinates of the exact location of the plot. And this allows for remote supervision so that for data collection to start, the data collector must necessarily be in the plot for that to happen. And then they enter the tag number. And once they select flowers present, then questions that apply to flowers present, like on open bus, open bus, um, up to 50% open bus, those options then follow. If they select no flowers present, then the skip logic does not ask any of these questions, but skips to the next interface. So the form can be made to be interactive and intelligent. There is a prompt also to take a picture, which is, is one of the codes that I included. So the observation, if it's present, then there is a prompt to take a picture if it's close enough. And um, they are also allowed to input any other observations that they may make on the field. This will give us clues into what animals or hot organisms are responsible for pollination. For instance, hot animals are feeding on fruits of the lianas, things like that. So here is a video illustration of... Lupe National Park is one of the 30... And so this is June 2021, we are about... For about a year now. We started the plot in um, July 2020, and so this is June 2021. We are about a year old at the Bobby site. Um, we have not had much challenges except for um, network connectivity challenges, and so sometimes the, the submission of the forms delays because they need to travel to nearby communities where the network is much stronger, and then they can submit the forms. Other challenge will be setting up the device. The, the, the project leader would have to use their credentials, username and password to set up the, the Kobo Collect account. And so if, if the field assistant or by mistake, they temper with those credentials, then you would have to go all the way to set it up again because of the security of the data that is being submitted from different sites. And so that is um, um, one of the disadvantages, if I may say. And then also another challenge we have faced is in maintaining field workers in the Ankasa site. Um, work had to be suspended from March this year because the field assistant um, um, had some challenges with supervisors at work, some management issues, and so he had to stop. So we are yet to find a replacement to continue with that monitoring. Remuneration for field assistants in each of those two places, they have we have two. Um, assistants who usually go to the field for security reasons. You can't have one person in the forest. And um, we pay $50 a month for the two people. So this is um, um, honestly and obviously quite very low. And so that is also one area. The work isn't funded yet. And so um, it's one of the challenges that we have faced. And um, in terms of logistics, it would be a good idea to have some binoculars to have more efficient tablets that um, can take the coordinates in the full site and also um, be e efficient in terms of connection, connecting to network services. It would be a good idea to have cameras that can be used to take pictures of observations that may be far off in the canopy. If you have good cameras, that will be very helpful. We can get some quality pictures. And um, at the moment, that we don't have weather stations in those sites where we are collecting data. And so you would have to rely on the nearest weather stations, which are usually some distance from the site. And so that also is um, a bit of a limitation here. Um, the other concern also, like in the Ankasa site, there was a challenge with institutional support, um, for which reason the field assistant felt that he, he, he could no longer continue the work. 
So that kind of um, support is, is required to have the agencies where the, the forests are located provide a lot more support and some leadership on sustaining the projects, if not initiating at least to sustain them by assigning dedicated staff of phenology monitoring in the long term. Because this is PhD, it will be over maybe in about a year or two. And so we have to find a way of sustaining these projects. In the Bobri side, the, the, the system in operation there is to adopt all projects that are going on as projects of, of um, the Bobri Research Center. However, the, the assistants that help in data collection are mostly um, national service personnel. They are there for a year of voluntary service. And so they may leave any time. And so there is still the question of sustainability of um, these studies. And so um, apart from these challenges, everything has been running smoothly. And um, we are still in talk with the African Phenology Network to see in what ways we can establish this for long term, not only here, but also in other places. I'm grateful to my full team. Daniel and Kwame have assisted in setting up the plots in all three locations. And Sami and Isaac and Eben have been doing the data collection. I'm also grateful to my supervisors and advisors whom I've had to consult at various times and to the management of the sites that we use to Idea Wild for providing binoculars and um, the diameter tapes that we have used on the field and also to African Phenology Network for some technical assistance at the very beginning of the project. Thank you for your attention. Okay, that is the end of the, the presentation. And I think I will give the back the the sharing to Emma if uh, she's here. Are we going to do a breakout just now before the? No, I think we didn't plan to do a breakout for okay. just moving to the the big breakout, uh, the big discussion. Great, let's do that. Mm. Let me turn on my video. Okay, thank you, Bismarck, for um, that presentation. Um, I thought that I would just give a bit of background on where this workshop series has come from and, and what's going to come up before we go into our discussion. Um, just to say we got funding um, to support the African Phenology Network over this sort of six month period from the Royal Society of Edinburgh. Um, this is a COP26 project to um, encourage um, international networks for, for research. And um, they have supported us to um, employ Aaron as the project coordinator for this period and to um, bring some uh, phenological cameras into the field sites that you have um, learned about already today. So we are currently in the process of ordering and delivering those to the field sites. Um, so that's going to be a new experience for, for most of us to give to, to have an opportunity to learn how to use cameras for phenological monitoring and to, to ground truth them alongside the monitoring that's already taking place. Um, as you'll have seen from the three sites represented here today, there's three very different ecological contexts. Um, we've got a mature tropical rainforest in Gabon, um, we've got, and, and in Ghana, a kind of a mixture of different um, ecosystems, but then a very um, human modified system in Kenya with much smaller trees in these clonal trials. So it will be a really useful opportunity to try out um, these uh, phenological cameras in different contexts and learn how to use them. Um, we're also planning on uh, releasing very soon an online capacity survey. So we are um, hoping to survey all of you and all of your contacts um, and colleagues on uh, what you think the opportunities for phenological monitoring in Africa are and what the logistical challenges might be um, to inform some recommendations for this, this network as it goes forward. And we're going to, this workshop is the very first of, of four planned workshops. Um, so this one is just to 
um, to bring these sort of few perspectives together and to start meeting each other and, and kind of understanding each other's context. Um, the next workshop is um, to learn from other um, monitoring networks internationally about um, things that work well when you're working together um, across different sites um, and things that we should avoid doing perhaps in order to stop um, you know repeating the same mistakes um, so that's coming up in a month's time so do watch out for for that when it's advertised um, and then after that we've scheduled two more workshops that are going to be much more discussion based so we will um, be trying to come up together with some recommendations for the African Phenology Network so if you've been you know interested in what's happening today then please do stick with us during this period um, and you you're very welcome to kind of become more involved as we develop those recommendations um, so first of all I just wanted to ask is there anyone in this group who is involved in phenological monitoring in Africa um, not at one of the sites already um, that's already presented I, th I think does anyone want to just introduce themselves um, I think I saw in the chat that there is someone here from Luango in Gabon. Um, is there anyone else who would like to take this opportunity to, to introduce a little bit of what they do? I'm just going back through the chat. So, um, so we've got uh, Diane Fossey Gorilla Fund working in DRC in Rwanda starting long-term fruit phenology studies um, in the home range of several chimp and gorilla groups in eastern DRC. Um, so that was somebody shared that in the chat and um, we have Yolandi Ernst from University of Whitworth water stand in South Africa um, interested in phenology but I don't know if that means that there's already monitoring taking place um, did anyone else pick up any others uh, many years of phenology data from Nubali and Doki National Park in Republic of Congo and that was from Victoria SDN um, and there was uh, Luango in, in Gabon. So um, if your site isn't already on the African Phenology Network map, um, please do go look at the website and follow the instructions for um, how to get yourself on that map so that we can begin to know who else is out there and um, you know how we can make connections between these research sites so um please go and have a look at that if you're if you're not represented it's great that you're here today and we'd love to hear more about um the phenology monitoring that you are involved in i'm just checking i haven't missed anybody um but uh i think um oh there's a couple of Okay, thanks. Aaron's put the link to the map in the chat. Um, and we've just heard from Christian um, Apoku Kwateng, monitoring phenology of um, Aubrigenia Tayensis in Ghana and Ivory Coast in Ghana. Fantastic. Um, there's often a lot more going on out there than sort of any of us realize. And it'd be really good mm -hmm. to make those connections, both like within national networks and then between countries as well, um, as we're doing now. Um, so I guess the, the, the topics that I've picked up on, but please put your hand up. I'm not seeing everyone's, I don't know, would someone let me know if their hands are up because I'm, I'm not seeing like everyone's, um, screens at once for some reason, but, um, ah, there we are. Uh, put your hand up if you, if you have any points that you would like to raise following today's presentations. Um, while I'm just looking for that, I was going to um, bring out that I think we're at a point where um, there, there is like an acceleration of networking between all of our sites that we're involved with. Um, and I think quite a lot of us find that we are moving into like an, 
uh, using new technologies for phenology monitoring to address some of the challenges that have been um, raised today about, you know, retaining very skilled staff over a very long time period. Can, can new technologies help us with some of that? Um, uh, I don't think they'll ever replace skilled botanists in the field. I think there's, there's room for both, um, but maybe we could um, uh, supplement some of these um, sites with with new technologies such as cameras and drones and remote sensing and this was coming up in the chat um, just earlier um, but there's also massive challenges in using that I know personally I'm not very knowledgeable about how to use these technologies in the field and um, it can seem really kind of challenging to get these um, cameras and uh, everything sort of established and so something that we're trying to do as a network is, is learn together over the next few months how to do that um, and if anyone has anything they'd like to raise kind of on that point it would be good to um, to talk together and um, Alison has raised their hand yeah. mm -hmm. should we hear from you can you hear me yes can, can you see me we sorry do. I have issues with my uh, camera Emma, what you're doing is amazing. You know, it's really, really great. And it's great to see um, the African Phenology Network, you know, doing so well. I just have something, I don't even know how relevant this might be. But have you looked at any, or even thought about looking at herbarium data? It might be something, I don't know if, it even, if there's much of it available for Africa, but that's another, you know, resource that can be tapped into for phenological work and it will be something just to have and I've done a little bit of work with remote sensing as well and um, well sometimes we say that there's less objectivity or subjectivity with the remote sensing like with humans if you show them the same tree we get lots of different answers for the you know how much flowering is going on or whatever so yeah and you're right it certainly will complement the ground data as well and I mean you'll learn lots about it as you go and once the camera is in the field of view of the data of the trees and things it'll be good and then one other question that uh oh, one other point um as regards trees I was the the guy what was his name Loic the guy who gave the presentation in French mm -hmm. right, really friend. interesting and I, I was wondering he I what my understanding was that he was looking at 800 trees. And I was just wondering if trees are the only plant functional type that are being monitored. I know somebody else was talking about lianas, but shrubs is another interesting um, plant functional type as well. But that's my contribution anyway, thanks. Great, Loic, did you understand the question or should Hervé translate for you? Oh, if you could unmute yourself, Loic. Ask to unmute. Let me just see if we can. Hervé, tu m'entends? Tu peux me. Oui, la question est traduire, mais traduire ça, s'il te plaît. La, oui, oui la, la question pour toi, c'était de. Elle voudrait savoir, à part les arbres, est-ce qu'il y a d'autres euh, euh, formes, euh, formes que vous observez bon, Comme les, les sous-bois, les, sous les arbustes. Oui, oui. <coughs> Pour répondre, oui, oui, dans la phénologie, nous avons des arbustes aussi qui font partie de, 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 de tout, les, tout le circuit, tout le réseau de phénologie de la SGC. Ouais. Okay. Et les petites plantes aussi. Toutes les plantes. Euh, non, pas, pas au niveau de l'herbe. Mais il y a, y, a, y, a, y a des arbustes adultes, mais petits. Oui. Oui, espèces, oui, oui. Voilà, petit que, que nous, nous tenons aussi. Ok, merci. Mais je vous en prie. Um, great, and Alison, I'm just writing down about the herbarium. Certainly, there's, I think, lots of opportunity to connect with um, herbaria um, specimens in terms of um, establishing sort of baseline sort of leafing and flowering over time and, and connecting that with climate change. There's There's been some interesting work done 
in other parts of the world um, for that. Um, it's something I'm now at the Royal Botanic Garden, Edinburgh, and it's something I was hoping to, to kind of develop um, in the near future as well. Um, I'm just writing down some of the things we're raising, not necessarily to kind of answer them, but just as the, you know, topics for our discussion going forward in future worktops, workshops. So, um, yeah, please do. If anyone else has anything that they just want to raise um, as a topic to be discussed in the future, then then please feel free to do that, and we can we can write them down. Um, are there any other hands up for anything anyone wants to say at this point? I think Emma. Mm -hmm. uh, we need a, we need few minutes again with the people of speaking French to summarize yeah. the, the last uh, part of the meeting. Sure. Should we should we do that then? Should we just go into breakout rooms for the final? Um, five yeah, minutes? I think. Yeah. yeah, I think so. And uh, I don't know. Aaron can now put like fifteen minutes. That should, should be the end. I don't know if you want to, you want the break, I won't come back. You have a nice, a last point to add? Uh, well, why don't we, why don't I make the last point now and then people can either stay in the breakout room or leave if they, they need to just for, for timekeeping. So, yeah, that is, yeah. yeah. So, um, okay. So thank you everyone for coming along today. Um, this is very much, we're all learning how to do this. We're all in coordinating this from different parts of the world and in different time zones so thank you for bearing with us when there have been pauses or um, uh, anything that's kind of not gone so smoothly but hopefully that we'll be learning as we go and this can something that will develop so please send feedback to us if there was something that could be done better um, we really want to make this as inclusive as, po as possible so we will be thinking about how to improve um, certainly the kind of translation aspects in future workshops um, maybe you know supplying captions for presentations in both French and English and um, uh, and just you know making more opportunity to discuss in a language which you, you know you feel comfortable in um, and um, please do follow us on Twitter it shouldn't be hard to find us African Phonology Network um, we also have the, the website African Phonology Network dot online um, I think Anyway, the, the link was in the, um, you can just Google it, you'll find it. And um, finally, we do have a mailing list. So after this um, workshop, Aaron will email you all to ask if you would like to join the mailing list. Um, and please do follow, follow that link if you would like to be kept informed of future workshops and opportunities to, um, to be more involved in the network. And um, yeah, please do be in touch with the steering group. So if I think the steering group all have their videos on, so if everyone could wave, um, that's yeah, Elve, Asanat, and Bismarck, and myself, um, and and we're we're keen to you know expand representatives from other countries as well. If if you are keen to kind of join us in in growing this network, um, yeah. So watch this space. Watch your emails for future things that are coming up and. Now is an opportunity to, to go into an English and French speaking breakout rooms just to finish this discussion and um, feel free to leave if you need to or, or stay around and continue the conversation. Okay, thank you, Emma. Thank I, you. 